Good morning um, and welcome to today's virtual panel discussion on nature-based recovery. Um, well, I should say good morning, good afternoon and good evening from wherever you are in the world. Um, today's webinar is brought to you by Climate Action. Uh, we have been working at the intersection of business, governments uh, and the NGO community to accelerate international sustainable development and advance the Paris Agreement for over 12 years now. Uh, established in 2007. Today's webinar forms part of a new project that we are running, the Roadmap to COP26. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the new dates have been announced for November 2021, so it's a rather long roadmap, but this is to ensure that uh, organisations maintain their momentum towards such an important um, climate meeting. Just a few housekeeping uh, bits before we go on to the discussion today. Uh, just so you're aware, this webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be available uh, within 24 hours of the webinar ending today. You can view this webinar on demand by going to www.climateaction.org and following the links to the digital event page. Please do engage with us today. We have a survey at the end. Um, your feedback is always welcomed and it really does make us, uh, make, help us make our webinars more engaging in the future. Now, how do you ask questions today? This is an open panel discussion and we are encouraging you all to ask as many questions as you, as you can and as you would like. Uh, how do you ask questions then? Uh, if you go to the control panel on the uh, right hand side of your screen, there's a drop down bar that says questions. You can type your questions in there. Um, we would love to know where you're from, who you are, what organization you're from. Um, and we would also uh, recommend if you do want to ask an individual panelist, please put their name before asking the question. Or if you would like to address the entire panel, please put all. You can also follow us at, uh, on our Twitter account at climate underscore action underscore and ask questions using the hashtag climate action live. They will both work. So uh, I would like to introduce our moderator for today. Uh, it's Mark Goff. He's the CEO of the Capitals Coalition. Uh, today's webinar is in partnership with the Capitals Coalition. So thank you very much, Mark. Can I get you to join us, please? Thank you very much, Rhys. And welcome, everyone, to the webinar today. Can a nature-based solutions approach become an integral part of a global economic recovery? A big question today. I hope you're all safe and well. Uh, at these challenging times. One of the things that uh, has been made very clear, I think, by COVID-19 and all of the difficulties we're facing is that it's an interconnected problem that we're facing here. Health, economic, social and environmental challenges have all got to be tackled systemically and we can't attack them um, individually. And that's one of the things that we're gonna be touching upon today. If we can just go over to the next slide. So a nature-based recovery here, um, what we're going to be looking at today is delivering value for people, economics and nature. So how do all of these things connect? Um, the role of nature-based solutions in creating this more resilient future that we're looking at. Smart policy, interventions for systems change, um, societal shifts, and also changing behavior. Um, and how is that gonna be based around nature-based alternatives? and the role of the private sector. And we've got a great panel today for you today to go through all of those. One of the things about nature-based solutions that surprises me is that actually it's common sense. And most of you that are on this webinar today will probably think that. Um, the amazing thing is how we've actually forgotten that nature provides all of these resources, the ecosystem services for us. Um, mainly for free. And what we've been doing over the last couple of hundred years is building these big concrete systems, these big gray infrastructure approaches to address something that nature has been able to provide for us and is providing for us for many, many years. So the way that capitals and the work that we're doing fits into this is that if you're going to apply a nature-based solution, you need to be able to see how it's going to be used, how best to apply it, and what the benefits of that are going to provide and that's where Capitals comes in. A Capitals approach will allow you to do that. And therefore, these two initiatives are very much connected. They're not in competition at all. And you need one to be able to do the other. There's an awful lot of people in our community, um, 370 organizations at the core, about 20,000 around the world are now applying Capitals approach in business, finance and through government. 
And through those communities, they're applying a lot of nature-based solutions. But what we're not seeing is this becoming mainstream. And today, we're gonna to try and find out through this webinar whether our speakers here believe that this can be a key part of that next recovery that we need here. Um, I'd just like to also mention our sponsor here today. Um, so if you're calling in from Europe, you'll be very familiar with Oatly. Uh, if you're not calling in from Europe, you will be very familiar with Oatly quite soon, I'm sure. Um, Oatly is a fast growing champion of plant-based foods. Uh, their purpose is to challenge conventional norms and to allow us to change our behaviors. So they believe that food systems more generally must be used more responsibly to tackle the challenges that we're facing, both in public health and in climate change. Um, and it's great that they're here with us today. And uh, Cecilia will be speaking in a little while. If we can move on to the next slide. So we've got a great panel, as I said, here today. Um, we're gonna start off with Tim. If Tim, if you could join me. Um, and the question I'm gonna ask all of you as an opening uh, piece here is uh, what role do you think nature-based solutions play in creating a more resilient future? Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Mark, uh, and happy World Environment Day to everybody. Um, under the hashtag for nature, the theme this year is biodiversity. So this webinar is very timely. Thanks to the Climate Action Team for organizing it. So even before COVID-19, let's remember that um, 800 million people were malnourished in the world, and that figure was going up for the first time in a decade. There's 3.2 billion people who were already negatively affected by land degradation and drought and biodiversity loss causes an annual 10% loss in the GDP, according to IPBES uh, in 2019. So uh, normal was also a crisis. Let's remember that. So when we think about going back to normal, that is not good enough. In fact, the World Bank estimates now that COVID-19 is likely to cause the first increase in global poverty since uh, 1998. So we must build back better for a world that is more clean, more green and more equal. So for doing that, we can learn from the financial crisis. And this is just my first message um, of the two I want to share in the beginning of this panel. So the first message is we cannot let this crisis um, go to waste. Uh, there's untold suffering out there and we have to recognize that. Um, what we can do to help people overcome it is to build a world that is better afterwards. In the financial crisis 2008, we did not quite manage that. In fact, emissions, the rate of emission increase tripled in the year after the financial crisis to 6% against the historical growth of 2%. So in this crisis today, we have to do better. And green recovery is a historic opportunity to bring together climate action, biodiversity action, and green jobs. So our colleagues at the International Labour Organization estimate that in their green jobs program, there's potential for 15 to 60 million new green jobs in the coming months and years. That's where our focus has to be. And the second message is on the role that nature can play to get us uh, nature-based solutions um, can of course provide up to one third of uh, climate mitigation that we most urgently need with the many co-benefits, including climate change adaptation that come with investments in nature. Um, but nature, of course, goes well beyond that. One third of, of all the world's top 105 cities depend on drinking water from protected areas. So nature is basically um, our life support system and we have to invest more in nature <clears throat> because we see that life support system uh, frailing. Um, with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which starts next year, UNEP and FAO, with many partners across the world, we are launching a global call to action for the generation restoration to rebuild a better world. That is going to require some investments as well. We estimate that the, the investments in nature and in restoration between now and 2030 will require about $1 trillion in public and private funds. <clears throat> that money is clearly there. It's, th this is only 0.01%. 1, it's one-tenth of 1% 1 of expected global GDP during that period. So we should uh, be able to make that kind of investment. <clears throat> and for each dollar invested in ecosystem restoration, we 
um, estimate with ICN and others who've worked on this that we can generate more than nine dollars in return. So absolutely nature needs to be part of building back better. Back over to you, Mark. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tim. And um, I'd now like to ask Maria, um, our next speaker, to answer the same question in a couple of minutes, if you can, what the role of nature-based solutions play in creating a more resilient future. Thank you. And thanks a lot for inviting us to speak as part of this World Environmental Day. I'm sure like many of, of you, we have been very busy preparing this day and in, in such an important moment. Uh, so we see the consequences of the pandemic and the impact that this is having on people. So climate change, unfortunately, is a pandemic that uh, will not go away. And we know that natural climate solutions can provide 30% of the solution, 30% of the emission reductions that are needed to meet the Paris Agreement. Not only they provide emission reductions, but they also create jobs. They provide socioeconomic benefits. They protect the ecosystems and the health of human beings and the local communities. So these are great uh, opportunities and business is standing behind those. There is a lot of traction from the business community to invest in natural climate solutions as part of their race uh, to net zero. But it's important from a business perspective and uh, our partners, uh, notably the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, in partnership with the World Economic Forum, have created the Natural Climate Solution Alliance. And their emphasis is that these natural climate solutions need to be credible. First of all, business, when using this, they need to look at the mitigation hierarchy. First, they need to avoid emissions. They need to produce deep decarbonization of their emissions and then, and then can use natural climate solutions. This can be a temporary solution for the how to abate sectors. And I know that this is some, sometimes a, a complicated subject, but let's face it, we need to reduce emissions by 50% in the next decade. And we know that natural climate solutions are available today. We know that for some of those how to abate the emissions uh, sectors, sorry, uh, technologies are not available. So, I think we have to accelerate the deployment of natural climate solutions as they are available in the next decade uh, and accelerate the research and innovation so that we can have the technologies that can reduce emissions in those hard to abate sectors. A natural climate solutions obviously should follow rigorous environmental and social safe worlds, which uh, may generate other environmental uh, benefits. And they, have, they need to have sound and verified carbon measurement and accounting methodologies. So together with the World Resource Institute, you know, we very much welcome the efforts and the World Business Council and other experts are working on creating that accounting framework that is very much needed. So we must build an effective and scalable carbon market that enables carbon sinks while protecting nature. And that's the third element that is quite important and where we need governments to get their act together. We have heard the estimates by ILO. In a moment when governments need to figure out what to do and how to bring so many unemployed people out of the um, unemployment list, um, we ask governments to look at these solutions and to accelerate the solutions that are available today that will provide the new jobs. So thanks a lot and look forward to the remaining discussion. Thank you very much, Maria. And now we're going to go over to Manuel. Um, and I'd like to ask you the same question as well, please, Manuel. So how do you think that nature-based solutions are going to play a role in a resilient future? And please turn on your camera. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Let, let, let me try to go straight to, to, to your question and to the point. And first, a happy World Environment Day. So to have nature-based solutions as a strong element for the recovery times for fiscal stimulus, stimulus package, we should consider four or five elements. The first one it is we should have clear principles for the recovery. Recently, with the uh, announcement of the recovery fund from, from Europe, the president of the EU announced that it, it, it will be framed by the principle do no harm, what it is important. And on the other hand, the Secretary General of UN, Antonio Guterres, during the Earth Day, he mentioned some principles for the recovery, including green jobs, uh, transitions, energy, industrial, and among some other transitions, 
including a circular economy, among some others. So it is important to have clear principles. And for example, one of those principles, it should be related to solutions that it, would, it should be a labor intensive solution. That is one principle. It should link to the long term. It should be sustainable solution. So the principles are a key element. The second element, it is to integrate. So when we think about recovery, it is the best time to integrate our economic objective with social considerations that are key in this time, health, access to water, among some others, with environmental ones that includes climate and for sure nation. So integration, it is a second element to secure that. But the third one, it is to recognize that we are working in an evolving concept. What I'm trying to say for today, nation-based solutions means almost everything and at the same time, nothing, because it is an evolving process. And fortunately or unfortunately, in this kind of process, some things could happen. And so for many people, everything that it is related to green, it could be recognized as a nation-based solution, but it is not true. We do need to define more clearly what exactly does it mean a nation-based solution and to secure the quality of those kinds of interventions. But also what we do need, and this is my four elements, it is to push the process towards a political recognition. Fortunately, in COP25, it has been recognized nation-based solution for the Standing Committee on Finance. But what we are trying to do it is to have COP26, the main decision, recognizing nation-based solutions as a key tool to raise our ambition and to put the world into a 1.5 trajectory. But we must do the same with the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So I am referring to the CBD that unfortunately and very weird, they have not yet recognized nature-based solutions as a concept. They are working based in what they call the ecosystem-based approach. So, so we do need to continue working in that side, in the desertification convention, in the ocean side, side sorry, among some others. And my last point, and Maria has already mentioned, we do need to recognize the red flags. There are red flags, there are contentious topics, as for example, it is just about planting trees. A, a, a biodiversity offset, it could be recognized as a nature-based solution. Are we going to replace our obligation to real and strong carbon reduction with nature-based solutions, or, or it should be a complementary tool? So all those kinds of considerations are key. And probably the last one, not every nature bankable project, it is a nature-based solution. So, so those are topics that we should address strongly and quickly as a way to make nature-based solutions a key element to raise ambition and to put the work into a good trajectory. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, and now we're going to pass over to Cecilia from Oatly, who's going to give us a little bit more information about what they're doing in this space. And also, please do try and answer this question as well. How is this going to play a part in a resilient future? Well, I think, uh, I think the crisis that we are a part of is also offering uh, uh, fantastic opportunities and I would like to uh, uh, exemplify with uh, the experience I have uh, with Oatly. Um, yes, so we're going to show that, uh, Reese first. Um, this is, you see, what I can see in my role at Oatly is that I see a shift going on, which is driven by consumers. There is an increased awareness now, and there is an increased um, demand for sustainable products, uh, which I find very promising uh, uh, in uh, as a solution for the future. Uh, and if I look at, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm talking about the food system here, but I think that's highly relevant to uh, have as a key focus area when you talk about uh, uh, nature-based solutions for the future. I mean, the food system in itself answers about uh, a third of the emission of greenhouse gases globally. Uh, so if we can change that, we can uh, do a lot. And the food system is also, or the food we eat and the diets we eat are also the main course, cause of deaths, actually, and uh, li causing lifestyle diseases such as cancer, diabetes type 2, uh, and uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, and we also have a growing problem with obesity uh, today and malnutrition. But we have, so 
So I think the food system is very, very important to address and talk about when you talk about finding solutions for the future. And as the European Commission recognized when they published uh, the farm to fork strategy uh, the other week, uh, is also in order to have a resilient food system, we need to redesign the food system. And the, the climate panel has also been very clear on that we need to uh, uh, redesign it and go towards a much more plant-based um, future and a plant-based uh, uh, food system. And what I find very, very encouraging in this is the growth. So we started off this uh, with this small film just to say like, yes, our demand, the demand of our products is so high that we have problems keeping up uh, with it. And we can see, and as you're all aware, we've seen young people taking to the streets, demanding action from policymakers. So I think looking at the plant-based segment, it's uh, there are estimates of it uh, having a growth over 10%, uh, 1,000%, 1,000%, 1,000%. Uh, and, uh, to uh, have a, a turnover of $140 billion uh, per year uh, within the next de decade. And it is all driven by aware consumers who want to change the behavior. And this is so cool because it's the first time we actually see that people want to change their diets to save the planet, not for their health, but for the planet. But the health issue is really, really critical as well. And what I would like to, uh, finish off with and we ourselves are, have a growth rate of 100% which is really unheard of within the food industry normally just a organic growth is just a couple of percent on average uh, so I think I think it's time for new uh, new things new ways of doing things and uh, what we try to do as a company is like we are value driven those are our values we really try genuinely to be a good uh, company. We're doing lots of mistakes, obviously, but we do really try to be. Uh, and we try also to be a voice in society advocating this uh, change that we see absolutely essential. And I am hopeful that this is a good way forward where business can play a very, very central role together with consumers. But the policy framework need to be be there to support the change and unfortunately I must say I see that lagging behind it's too slow and it lacks the courage that is necessary and the younger generations are asking for thank you thank you very much Cecilia and if I could ask all of the speakers to come back on now we're going to remind you please do put your questions into the panel the Q&A uh, panel here um, and make it clear um, your organization and whom you are addressing with a question and then we'll come around to those questions and the rest of this session here is going to be based around a debate so we do want to have that conversation so Cecilia there you were just saying that you weren't hopeful um, that um, sets us off I think now at a difficult um, difficult starting point because we've got a long way no, to go sorry did you go see on. I was not hopeful no no uh, yes, I'm I... super hopeful super Good. hopeful I did because Consumers are there, the young generations are there, it's my generation holding them back. No, 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 the future is there, absolutely. Let me be good, clear good. on that. <laughs> good, thank you for clarifying. I, I started getting slightly depressed on World Environment no, no, Day no, then. No. I, no, good, okay, so we're hopeful, we're hopeful we can do this. So um, so maybe I'll start with you, Tim, coming back to you. Um, we're starting to see uh, nature-based solutions, or are we starting to see it, being based into economic stimulus packages? Is this something we're seeing now, or is it going to be included in the stimulus packages we're seeing from countries? You're on mute, Tim, I think. Um, just need to unmute you, if we can. Yes, Charles, I'm unmuted here, okay. Excellent. So I first would like to support Cecilia in saying that I'm also very hopeful. Uh, we did a survey amongst companies that were considering to invest in a major way in nature-based solutions and there's only about one third of them who are now reconsidering their plans because of the current crisis. Uh, it's about one third that stays the course and one third has even increased their focus on, um, on nature-based solutions. And of course the two main sectors are the, um, the agri-food industry for supply chain resilience and, and security and quality and uh, nature-based solutions as a climate change mitigation measure. So that is a big topic, and Manuel already raised the red flags that are potentially connected with this, but uh, we, we have to make sure we 
channel this energy into the right direction because this is a potential multi-billion dollar a year conservation and restoration market. This is the step change we need in the field of nature conservation and restoration. And we know how to do this right now uh, after 10 years of experience with RAD Plus, after many decades of experience with protected areas. So we know how to get it right. And that interest has to be channeled in the right directions, including by policy signals. And again, uh, Cecilia, I would <laughs> agree that the policy is lagging a little bit behind, but there are good news. Uh, Mark, you asked, is, there, is this happening? So let's remember in the midst of this pandemic, the European Commission launched its 2030 biodiversity strategy, aiming to protect 30% of the EU's land, 30% of the sea area. The farm to fork strategy will reduce pesticides by 50%. Lift organic farming to 25%. What is what is quite unique in this though is that the strategy also will look at the deforestation footprint of the EU through imports, and this of course uh, includes um, the imports of beef of other major deforestation commodities, and this makes me quite hopeful. Um, it's it is happening. One other signal that made me hopeful is that Germany decided not to bow to the pressure of the car industry to support fossil cars. So um, they were considering to spend 2.5 billion euros on purchase premiums for fossil cars, but uh, they've decided against that. And in a country like Germany, the, the car industry is, is, has, has a big seat at the table and this is it's quite an encouraging signal. So, so building on that then, Maria, you um, obviously represent a lot of businesses here. Uh, Tim's saying that the incentive mechanisms are, are there and we have got some of those solutions. How do we package up the nature-based solutions in such a way for businesses to be able to take those on? Very obviously, it's the obvious solution for them. Well, I think companies want to invest in credible projects. And unfortunately, when I'm talking to companies, they don't know where those are, okay? So, which is kind of, <laughs> come on, <laughs> there's lots of investment uh, waiting, but there are no credible projects. So this is a great opportunity for the promoters and for those, uh, but then how can we make those credible? No? I think this community needs to ensure that it's very clear what is credible and let's be pragmatic so that we can channel all that investment uh, into it. Companies want to account for those emission reductions as part of their uh, emission reduction plans um, or as part of their activities, etc. But the methodologies are not there. So let's just speed up in creating those methodologies so that the business can, can properly account because business like to measure what they do. And if they cannot measure how they can manage, okay, so it's for business quite obvious. Then companies want to see compliance markets including natural climate solutions investments, but this is not the case. So how can we accelerate the development of those compliance mechanisms with all, this, all the environmental rigor that is required and how can we integrate natural climate solutions as part of the NDCs? So one could say, you know, should we tell governments to spend their stimulus packages in, in natural climate solutions? Of course, we will, or nature-based solutions, of course, we should. But I would rather say, why don't we put the policies in place so that the investment community can invest there? And that's where we should be laser focused on spending all our tanks. And that requires maybe dancing in between aspects that maybe the environmental community has had difficulties in the past, but bringing a much more pragmatic approach. We just don't have time to discuss uh, um, um, into, I'm sorry, ideological aspects. We just need to accelerate these investments because I think the world needs them. We need to have those uh, mechanisms in place so that that uh, money that is sitting um, can be deployed uh, for the benefit of the planet, the people, the climate, and the recovery. So thank you. Thank you. And Cecilia, so you were saying 100% growth. That's astounding. That's amazing. You very rarely see that sort of growth here. So you've got something here that is really working. And we're talking here about investments going to the right place. A, a lot of what you're doing is about um, marketing and engagement as well. How do we nudge people to make the right decisions? Because ultimately, this is about people on the ground. We've got the institutions and things. But how do we make the people make this change that we're doing? Um, I'd like to raise 
three points uh, on that. First of all, awareness, information, and there's where I think uh, uh, the policy framework needs to take that into account to educate uh, people and start early. Uh, what is a sustainable lifestyle? Uh, and not older generations, because as I pointed out in my previous previous remark, I can see the young people are there. I mean, they're they're pushing for it. Uh, which is so cool and that was warms my heart and makes me really believe in a bright uh, future for us. They are there, uh, whereas we have created a system which is very complex and difficult to m maneuver in and move quickly. As Maria pointed out, we need to be much faster. We cannot have the perfect solution waiting for that in order to move ahead. Uh, so I would like to uh, move on to my second point, uh, what we have started doing as a company, which I think is very important because I think looking again at the consumption side of uh, things, many times it's price mechanisms that actually are the steering, uh, uh, what's steering the, uh, the, the purchase uh, or when we go shopping, the shopping's behavior, shopper's behavior. Uh, not least when it comes to food. And we know for sure that price do not internalize the externalities. That, I mean, the impact the production have on the, on the planet. Uh, so what we started doing, and we decided to move ahead, not waiting for the perfect methodology. It is a good methodology, but we started to declare the climate footprint on all our products. And we are working together with a third party who is doing it on the basis of 20 years of research. But I find this a really cool, uh, cool way of it, trying to internalize. Because today, if you look at the food, for instance, you have the price and you have the nutritional value. What else can you go, go after? But if, if you can also include the climate footprint in, in exact and, uh, and absolute numbers, not a traffic light system. I'm talking about numbers because the coolest would be if I could compare what does this cardigan cost and what does the computer cost what does the food cost so i have an idea of climate impact and one could argue well nobody would understand but everybody can compare 0 0.5 to 20. everybody would understand that 20 is high and over time you would learn uh, so i think that is my second point i would really really be in strong favor of a mandatory cl climate footprint declaration on products in absolute numbers, because that's a big pedagogic um, uh, impact uh, as well. And thirdly, again, to underline uh, uh, what you said, uh, Mark, to, to mobilize, I can see our communication with our consumers. We have real, real, uh, like people that love us, adore us, and who defend us when we get criticized. We also have lots of haters because we, we challenge norms. We are in a paradigm shift. That is what causes the difficulty, but it's also what's so cool because it really creates opportunities for us. Uh, and you need to be able to, you need to, you need to dare to stand your ground and stand for something. And actually that you want to be ahead instead of trying to please everybody, because we are in a paradigm shift. We can see it everywhere in every context of society. Look at what's going on around us right now. And we need to, ch to choose the right way forward. And I can see on our growth rate, and I have lots of numbers here with, the, with just uh, on plant-based foods globally, there is, that's a good example. There's money, it attracts investors, uh, there's employment opportunities, there are innovations. I mean, it's so cool and it's driven by young generations who want to change the future. Manuel, the, um, there's a question just coming here about some criticisms about uh, nature-based solutions and that large companies might be using this as a way of avoiding their responsibilities. So building on what Cecilia was just saying there, I mean, it all sounds really positive, but in your experience, and you've had lots of experience across lots of different um, areas and now at WWF, is there, how do we, how do we avoid the, the downside of this? Because there's a lot of opportunities for companies like Oatly, but there's a lot of companies we know that are not necessarily fit for the future. How do we make sure that we can avoid falling into that trap? Well, that is a big question, but there are many, many things that we must do. So let me start by the most simple, go back to the foundation. What we do need it is to have us well aligned around a common concept. You know that it has been IUCN who probably, who has promoted more the idea of a concept and now they are close to releasing standards and, and guidelines and also a governance body. What I do think it is a good idea. But, but let me go to the concept. 
when we think about nation-based solutions, Mark, we are talking about three main values. First, we are talking about the value of the intervention on nature. Secondly, we are talking about the societal challenge, that nation-based solutions must address a societal challenge. That is key. And third, the co-benefits. So, so it is as clear as that. But to secure the quality of a nation-based solutions intervention, what we do need to have, it is mechanism that can secure that quality. So for example, indicators, means of verification, and those kinds of elements. Let me put an example. I am the chairman of what it is called the Evaluation Council of the Green Bonds, the French Green Bonds, the Sovereign Green Bonds. What are we doing in a, a regular basis? We are evaluating the outputs and outcomes of the different investment by, the, by, by, by that French Green Bond. So, so that is the way in which we should continue making this nation-based solution process evolve. So that is the first, a line in between the concepts. But there is a second element that it is a key one, that it is what we do need to have, it is a political recognition of the concept that I've already mentioned. We are working for that. We have gotten something in, in, in the climate arena. We haven't yet in the CBD. So we do need to continue working to have parties recognizing the opportunity that nature-based solutions can bring to them. But the third element that also it is important, and I've already mentioned, it is that by working in nature-based solutions, what we do need, it is to break silos. We used to work in a very isolated way, and Cecilia probably could confirm that. Forests used to be alone. Food used to be out of the debate. Conservation protected areas used to be out of the debate. But by working through nature-based solutions, we are integrating concepts. And we do need to keep that way of working. That is key. And my fourth element, Mark, very important, it is we should remind what science has already told us. The 1.5 1 special report is talking about four transitions, not just one, four transitions. The energy and industrial one, the transport, the urban, and the land one. So, so, so we do need to recognize that the four of them are, are, are equal, are important, so are complementary tools. And all of those transitions should be focused in putting the world towards a 1.5 trajectory. So we never, we should never forget the objective, the main objective. So, so, and for sure, we do need ways to start to choose what it could qualify as a nature-based solution. Not every intervention to nature it is a nation-based solution. That is a key element that we must recognize and we should work based on. So, so Maria uh, De Filippo here has just asked a question about the EU taxonomy. So building on what you've just said there, we've got a lot of policy connections here. And Cecilia, you were saying that we need to have a measurement thing. How does that, does the taxonomy get us far enough, do we think? I mean, at the moment it's focusing very much on climate. Is this gonna be a piece that is gonna play a part in this? Tim, you're nodding. Did you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, tools like the taxonomy are immensely um, powerful over time. It's, it's a very technical subject, and there's probably only few people uh, who, who have participated uh, in all aspects of developing the taxonomy for what constitutes a sustainable financial investment. But these kinds of guidelines will eventually help to determine how billions of euros, in this case, are invested from pension funds, from uh, investors. Let's not forget that the food industry is a $1.7 trillion a year industry. I mean, uh, Cecilia, with all your growth rate, uh, it will probably take a long time and, uh, until companies like yours are at, uh, at a big player level. And we have to make sure that that entire industry makes a shift. So uh, having companies who make the first step is important, but we have to, through regulation, uh, but in, in the absence of regulation and in the time it takes, first through working with, um, with leaders in that field, shift the needle. We, we launched a fund together with the Dutch bank and the Dutch government uh, last year for a $1 billion um, loan facility to farmers who want to make that transition in developing countries called the Agri3 Fund. Again, $1 billion in a $1.7 trillion uh, food agri agri food industry is is a drop in the bucket, but by making these things very visible, we show to the rest of the industry that there's a train that's leaving the station, and you better be on it. So we have to not only be strategic in where we make these kinds of investments, but then also ensure they are well communicated and they're followed um, over time by guidance that makes this a norm. 
and that is starting to happen. Cecilia, you, you, um, you were nodding through that bit as well. I noticed and about this measurement taxonomy. Did you want to come in? Yeah, no, I think I, I agree with Tim there. I mean, I think that is, of course, an important tool uh, to steer investments. And we know for sure today that investors more and more want to, to uh, invest in sustainable business. And we can see a growing demand on business uh, at all. If you do not work on sustainability, you're not interested uh, an interesting company to invest in anymore. So, so that is promising. So I think it has a role to play. I would and I agree, I agree, Tim. I think we are a small company. We've been fast growing. When I joined the company uh, four years ago, we were like 80 people, I think, and we had a turnover of 265 million Swedish crowns. So it's like a really, really small company. But the, what is interesting here, and that's gone very, very fast, is the growth rate. So now we have 550 employees, something like that, all over the world. Uh, we're building factories all over the world to, to try to accommodate the immense and growing demand. Uh, comp competitors are moving into the market. We've been, we've been first uh, out there. And, uh, and we had, uh, last year we had a turnover of two, um, two billion uh, Swedish crowns. So that's an incredible growth rate, which is good, which is promising, which is really fun. So the established companies also see that this is where it happens, right? Because still money will will drive. So that could move faster, but there are policies, unfortunately, in the policy framework, which is preserving old traditions. And yeah. can, can I give can I give one example, which is quite uh, uh, cool? Uh, because if you look at farmers, for instance, that's a really tough profession because you've all nor, normally you've had it over generations and the system we've created, you have to increase the volume in, uh, in, uh, uh, to be able to survive, right? It's not about diversifying, but actually more industrializing uh, the farms and to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and we, uh, we have, uh, we're investing in a research project which is on farming, how to, how to do transition from 100% uh, animal-based farming to more diversified uh, uh, farming. And uh, it started with one small project in, uh, in Sweden, a small farm, and which was really cool when he, when he produced uh, uh, a 90% uh, uh, animal production uh, and to the next year he just increased uh, the uh, the share of uh, production for human consumption with the uh, 16%, he could triple the number of people we could feed from 60 to 188 by that small, small adjustment, which is super cool because we haven't addressed that, but that's another challenge we have. We need to feed a growing population. And he more uh, um, he, uh, he decreased the emission of greenhouse gases from 1.7 to 0.72. And the land use, of course, was much more efficient. So with that small example, and I would do it, you can show that there is a way form, uh, forward, but the policies, there are still subsidies, taxes, uh, and stuff that, that preserve the old uh, thing. And we did this at EU level, and we went out and thought, God, would anybody want to interested to apply for this? And this was in Sweden. We wanted 10 farmers to engage and continue to have this research study to see what was possible to, to uh, achieve. And Sweden is a small country, as you know. And we had over 100 farmers. And all of them said, because they are, they are business people as well, right? All of them said that they were interested in doing a transition, but they didn't know how, because the yeah. policy framework doesn't support it. So, so Maria, how did, how did, uh, there's, there's lots of businesses involved in the, in the um, we mean business in that bit. How, how do we, how do we, how are they applying this? It's a great example Cecilia's just giving us. What is the actual ways that they're turning this into an economic benefit for themselves in your experience? Have you got experiences of that? Well, I think that there's many, many businesses that are active on this space. I think it's quite interesting. So, so the, the approach of, of Nestle is one of the companies I spoke to recently, a big multinational, um, and they were saying, okay, well, they they have a, a goal to be net zero by 2050, but, uh, you know, as much as they have done everything they can in many of the solutions, sometimes the technology, even for, for uh, that company, is not available. So they were looking at, uh, at, at investing in natural climate solutions, both in their supply chain, but also in the ecosystems where they operate, creating an ecosystem approach. So I think that is really interesting. As I say, I, 
I, I think the companies that are looking at investment that I said said before, um, the, there is a lot of work to do to channel that uh, investment um, appetite um, into credible projects. So I think most of the companies are trying to, to, to see where those projects are and how they can um, include them as part of the decarbonisation strategy. So, so, so it's, the proving, it's the proving that this is actually creating a benefit for them in some way that is the challenge here. That's what's coming through, is it? That actually, the credible projects are proving it. So Manuel, how do we answer that? How do we, how do we make sure that these projects on the ground are going to um, deliver what Maria's companies would need? You know that probably we don't need to have many things. The first one is to be clear on against what we are developing that project. So that is the importance of nature based solutions. As I already mentioned, we should work to address a societal challenge. And that societal challenge, it could be related to an NDC, it could be related, it could be related to a development plan, to a long term strategy, among some others. So we will fit in some way the political side with the economic side. So that is one first challenge. The second one, it is to be clear what kind of benefits and to value those benefits it could be bring to the company, to the nature, and to the human being, because that is important. Oh, finally, the importance of a, a, a nation-based solution. Also, this is related to what it is called System B, companies with purpose. Now it is very clear how much companies are switching their objective, their main objective, or their main commercial purpose into be more social and more environmental one. So, so also that is an element that it could be uh, considered. But, but, but to do, and, and probably Mark, the, the, the last element that I don't want to forget, it is more related in between, the relation in between nature and the economy. Probably that is the missing point of this discussion. And that is something in which the world is strongly working on. Uh, as, as we know, the UK has commissioned this, that Gupta review to build that narrative in between the nature and the economy. The World Economic Forum is working on that. We as WWF with our Living Planet Report, in our point of view, what we should do also it is to create a global commission on nature and the economy to start to think how much we can really create that narrative for the future to build the foundation to potential commercial kind of initiative. But, but, but my last point, Mark, it is, and I've already mentioned, not any nature bankable project, it is a nature-based solution. One. That is a really key element. You could have nature, uh, uh, nature bankable projects that are not addressing a specific societal challenge. So we do need to continue building this kind of link. And, and probably my last point that it is really important, and I mentioned in my opening, it is offsets. The, the offsets are nature-based solutions, or it could be a last resource. No, because again, we don't need to focus in real carbon reduction to after that probably by clear rules to accept biodiversity of offset as a large resource. But to do that, what we do need to finish, it is the reflection and the regulation of Article 6. Carbon markets, Article 6, biodiversity offset and nature-based solution, it is the pending task. So, so is, is it policy then? Is it, is it, what, what would we need in that policy driver to make this work then? Because what, what you were setting out there, Manuel, is I, I think that, you know, there are drivers for different people in the system, but we're coming back round to this Article 6 and the policy drivers. Is it, is it policy that's going to drive this change or is it going to be the businesses seeing the benefit? The combination of both. You know that you can have the, the two approaches. Many people think that by creating the correct, in, the most accurate incentive to the business, in, incentive, sorry, to the business sector, you can really lever, you know, that kind of, of uh, positive action. I am probably more a political side guy, no? But, but by the end, it is a combination of both. Sometimes you do need to have a good political framework to create incentive. And on the other hand, sometimes by the correct incentive, you can promote the policy. No, my experience told me that it is a combination of both. Yeah, I can see everyone smiling at that. Tim, you want to come in? Yeah, on the policy aspect, um, there are quite a few things happening that are um, that are exciting. One is um, on the fiscal policy reform. I fully agree that that is an important signal to uh, the market. Let's remember that in the 53 countries where the OECD maps this, we spend $705 billion per year on agricultural subsidies. 
most for, mostly for food security, but many of them are locking us into the current way of doing business, which is bad for the climate, bad for biodiversity, bad for nutrition, bad for people's health. So there's a huge uh, opportunity for reform. And together with UNDP, we're coming out with a report this year on agri um, uh, policy uh, fiscal reform. In the context of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, a big part of our strategy is to look at not only agriculture uh, subsidies, but fossil fuel subsidies and how they could be repurposed um, for investments in nature and in restoration. Uh, that potential is, of course, even uh, much larger than the agriculture subsidies. Um, the, at the UN level, there is a something called the Manual for National Statistics, which determines how governments measure their national wealth. The one we all know is GDP. That is the mantra of every politician, but it's a very narrow indicator. And that has now been broadened. There's something called the System of Environmental Economic Accounts, and um, it allows countries to measure better what they are doing with their nation's wealth. That includes natural capital. Mark, you, you know this very well, of course. Um, and the progress that we've made there is, again, going to play out over time so that governments will be able to measure uh, their wealth much more comprehensively than only with GDP. And that is a really, really important change uh, over time. So policy signals and policy reform, very important, but I also agree with Manuel, we need some champions and businesses who uh, move ahead and also push the needle and push for um, a level playing field and policy reform together with uh, all of us on the call and others. And, and over 100 governments obviously have made commitments to actually start changing that accounting, applying the um, UN SEER work. We've got a government dialogue which is helping them through that process and connecting that back up to corporates as well. As, uh, and one more question here, Catherine Farrell's talking about how those accounting practices, you were saying there, Tim, um, we've got to see across all of the social, the human, all of these elements together. Can accounting help us to do this? I know, Cecilia, you've been looking at doing more accounting within your organization of including the impacts, the dependencies of nature people on this. How does that play out for you? Uh, you're referring to the Climate Footprint uh, Declaration uh, yeah. now. Yeah, uh, and yeah, yeah, natural yeah, capital, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think... I think uh, I think what Tim is addressing is super important. I agree with, with you. And that, that is, uh, I mean, GDP is so narrow. And people are about much more than uh, GDP. And look at yourselves as individual. What, what does genuinely make you happy? It's not the money. It is when you're out in the nature. And I think that awareness um, uh, uh, is growing. Uh, but for us, of course, uh, of course, we are in a system where, uh, where what you measure matters, like Maria pointed out in her uh, remark earlier. That's where we still are. And uh, and to us, yeah, the Climate Footprint Declaration, that has engaged the entire company. Uh, and we're really, because it becomes so visible and it also, it's also a trigger for us to all the way improve. That, that's also why we think it's an incentive for the industry to make better in that respect. Because when you see a number, it's much uh, uh, better. I think, uh, yeah, that, that would be my, uh, would you want anything more, uh, Mark, uh, more elaborated? On it. No, 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 I think it's really helpful. Manuel, you wanted to come in, did you? Manuel there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, sorry, Mark. Yeah, I, I think that in, in, in some way, uh, I've already mentioned what we do need is to have clear way to track progress, clear way to measure. That is a key element when we think about nature-based solutions, and that is what we haven't yet developed well. No? So, so, so still it is a broader concept, but we do need to work to define accounting mechanism that that is a key element and let me say something probably we are not completely aware that as much political traction this concept could get as for example cop 25 cop 26 as more constrained concept is going to be because when we think about a party driven process at cop it is clear that countries are going to demand more clarity numbers ways to measure ways to report and those kind of things. So, so accounting it, it will become a key element when we think about nature-based solution. Um, and Maria, for you as well, are your companies um, looking to being applying new accounting methods? Will they be taking those into the COPs as a way of proving what they're doing? Well, I think they need they need accounting uh, practice, but they that work for business, and so that's yep. where the 
the work that the World Resource Institute is doing with WBCSD is quite interesting. Uh, let me let me insist that um, companies want to see that compliance markets uh, scale the use of natural climate solutions that provide the, the incentives to to invest there. It, it is fundamental. It's well um, understood. There is a voluntary market, but it's very small, and we need to scale up. There is 30 percent of the of the emission reductions could be achieved with these solutions. So I think we just need to overcome. Uh, you know, go beyond the voluntary markets, create the incentives. So governments need to really get their act together to, 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 to create those incentives to the compliance markets uh, for the investment to be accelerated. Is 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 as straightforward as, as that. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things that we've been working through with the community we're with is that everything we've done till now has been very much around the language of we could do this, we could do that. We're moving into we should do that together, and we have to get to we must by the end of this decade if we're going to deliver the sustainable development goals. Uh, one last question I'm going to ask all of you before we close it up here, and I just want a, a score from you all. So let's try and put this into a very practical way of getting it forward. You can't say 100% Cecilia just because that's your profit at the moment, okay? <laughs> so uh, on a scale from one to 10, okay, how confident are you that plans to build back better will include nature-based recovery as a core component? So is nature-based recovery going to be in there? Is it going to be five around the middle? Is it going to be near the top? Is it going to be in there? You know, seven, eight, nine, ten, or is it not going to be there? So where do you think it's going to be? Let's start with what you, Tim. What is the time frame? What's the time frame? Ti oh, time frame, time frame. Uh, you can ask me when COVID's going to be over. That's, uh, I can't answer that one. Um, so we're going to, let's say over the next two to three years on building back better, are we going to see nature-based solutions being a key part of that package going forward? Okay, so. Could I ask to start, Mark, because I have yes, another go on, then, please. meeting. You've got to run. Please do, John. So I, I will put a seven. Seven, excellent. Maria, yes. what are you going for? I agree, seven. Seven, Manuel? Seven. Seven, and <laughs> Tim? Yeah. Yep, same here, seven. Seven, hang on. So 28 in total, excellent. This is like strictly yeah, one dancing. We, we follow the something. leaders. We follow <laughs> the <laughs> senior the leaders. Something, something important, Mark. Yes, Manuel, please. Short. We have focused today in nature-based solutions, but it is nature-based solutions and beyond. We have for the next year, for example, just one example, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. We do need yeah. to get a strong outcomes there. So, so it is nature-based solutions, CBD, this idea of a nature deal, many, many things around the nature concept that could help to have probably, I hope, a nine in relation to nature in the recovery. Excellent. So we're saying seven now, but we're all going to work. Everyone on this call today, we're all going to be working towards a nine. And that's where we're going to connect up the systems, CBD, the COP, all of this together. Thank you so much for all your time today. Thank you for the panelists. It's been a really good conversation. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, and I think we're passing back to Reese just to close us off. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mark, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I just want to say a special thank you uh, to Cecilia for joining us and for Oatly for their support, um, and indeed to Mark and the Capitals Coalition uh, for co-collaborating with us on this today. So thank you all. And, and a thank you to everyone listening and tuning in today. It's a busy day for World Environment Day, um, but thank you for choosing us for this hour. Uh, there's a lot more content throughout the day to come. Uh, again, thank you to Mark. Uh, fantastic moderation. Great questions. We got through as many as we could. Um, and sorry if we didn't manage to get through, uh, get to your question. And uh, please, everyone who's still online, do join us for uh, our upcoming webinars. You can subscribe uh, to our website, climateaction.org. You can subscribe to our newsletter and our mailing list and our community that we are building uh, on this roadmap to COP26. The next webinar then, uh, next week, 10th of June, uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, British summer time, that's two o'clock CEST if you're in Europe. And uh, it's on how is COVID-19 refocusing sustainable finance with uh, some fantastic speakers uh, and, and, and investment partners as well. Thank you very much for attending uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. This will be available online within the next 24 hours. <laughs>